So the after effect portion of the Ocelli effect begins now. And uh, normally I would keep this restricted to just members only and Patreon people and all that good stuff uh, because that's what I do when it goes over two hours. But tonight we're going to go past the two-hour mark and I'm going to make this available to everybody because I think it is extremely important to have a handle on the background information and the reality of the mindset of individuals that are actively participating in what we're watching unfold on the world stage today. If you've been under a rock, obviously, or you've been refusing to participate in the news cycle altogether, you might have missed that, uh, yes, indeed, the opening of the, although they're saying it's not exactly safe enough to uh, bring everybody on in to the embassy, in Jerusalem has occurred, and Jared Kushner was there, and John Hagee was there, and the uh, Jeffress uh, uh, preacher was there as well, uh, along with Netanyahu and various others, to celebrate the fact that finally, after 70 years, exactly, of the existence of the nation-state of Israel, uh, here we are, we finally have the uh, consulate and uh, <laughs> embassy in Jerusalem. And what does it mean, and why does it tie so tightly to the end of times and end of days prophecies, the rapture, uh, fundamentalist Christianity as it is described in general? Why is it that America seems to be the servant of the nation-state of Israel regardless of its actions? And was there a blood sacrifice occurring, or is it just another day in the Gaza Strip where this happens well there hasn't been this kind of a casualty count since at least 2014 although there are constantly casualties there you might not know it very well but it does occur all the time not just in gaza but in the territory called palestine and um gee does this make donald trump an instrument of god according to some people it certainly does but anyway we're putting it in context, and uh, Daniel Lewis Crumpton is with me, the author of Then Came the Flood, the guy behind DownloadedContent.com, uh, a friend and uh, member of my family as far as I'm concerned. Amen, uh, brother. So, and, and absolutely, we have been to church together. We have, uh, we have actually prayed together. We have observed various things together, and uh, we're, we're there for assisting one another sometimes in navigating uh, what it is we're seeing. And, you know, I, I'm not the expert when it comes to the Baptist and evangelical point of view, certainly. I, I, I see it. I am frustrated by it. But Daniel has a better handle on that part of it, and yeah. he's helping yeah. us get a handle on it tonight. So go ahead, brother. Yeah, and, and what's so funny about it, you and I were discussing it um, <clears throat> my spiritual evolution took me to several different places outside the Baptist church. And whenever I come up against Baptists now, now I don't debate religion. I'm not going to do that. I mean, I'll, I'm, I'll have a civilized conversation with somebody who disagrees, but the minute it turns into debate is I'm done. Not, you know, I don't, I don't have anything to prove in that regards, but you know, I do find it amusing when it's attempted and not, I think it was this past Easter. You know, I put a little cute graphic out about, you know, Jesus is risen. Psych. You know, Happy Fool's Day, or uh, April Fool's Day, whatever. Well, and because Easter fell on April 1st, yeah. literally, so. Yeah, I thought and, that was, yeah. I, I thought I couldn't be the only person that thought that was just funny. It was, wasn't a commentary on Christians, or the Bible, or Jesus. It was just, it's Easter, he's risen on April Fool's Day. That's kind of funny, right? Well, and, you obviously are saying that all Christians are fools, Daniel. What is wrong with you? Yeah get a lot of that and, and, a, and a few fundamentalists i'm not going to name names but a few fundamentalists like really quickly you know they didn't want to come out and snipe me in ego so they would put one or two scriptures up there and you saw this myself you know my response was entire chapters in context right um because it's funny you know whenever people who disagree with what you're saying about scripture when they disagree with you they'll take one or two scriptures one or two verses and they really don't want you to read above or below it, because then you would have context, so they can say whatever they want to say, right? So context takes time. It takes a little bit more than the Internet generation's attention span a lot. Does that make sense? 
Well, it certainly does. And to tell you the truth, the last guy that uh, that I valued, you know, the uh, the out of context pieces of the Bible from was Thomas Jefferson. So, um, you know, and, and that's an interesting read, by the way, the okay. Jefferson Bible and all that. Yep. Uh, but outside of his attempt to, I don't know, take away the esoteric aspects of the scriptures in a way, um, which is an interesting study. I'm not saying that it's, you know, something anybody should adhere to or whatever. I'm just saying that's interesting and well thought out. But uh, quite honestly, usually when people are doing this and pulling portions of quotes out of context and uh, trying to justify their actions with it, it's usually because that is what they were taught to regurgitate from something else that they had been either force-fed or voluntarily uh, uh, fed because they were so spiritually hungry at one point. They accepted these explanations, and it is interesting to uh, remind people that a lot of those that are born again are usually people that, you know, Robin Williams, I think, once said that uh, once you're a born-again Christian, it means that you've effed up enough on this planet that uh, nobody else will take your calls, so it's time to call Jesus. Um, And I thought that that was extremely hysterical, and, well, again, makes sense. You know, a lot of people come to religion when they're in prison. A lot of people come to a spiritual faith when they have lost everything, uh, and they they get a bit of humility and become a bit humble, and their minds and their hearts do open. But um, and and I don't begrudge anybody that transformative event. It is uh, something that uh, feels like to me almost everybody should experience in their lifetime, and I've had to experience it several times uh, personally, where I've you know. <laughs> You're, you're lying on your face and you don't have the strength to stand up and you're wondering if you're going to inhale the dirt below your nose. Um, it does create a bit of perspective for someone to have to uh, uh, come back from. And, you know, you're, you're, you're snickering because you know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and, and I'm not saying that this is not a potent and legitimate event in people's lives that causes them to uh, adopt a spirituality. Sometimes, though, I think uh, it also leaves many well, hey, look, vulnerable man, look, as well. Look, any any incident that invokes a spiritual uh, inquisition within a person is a, is ultimately good. But don't don't stay there. Spirituality is a path. If you're hanging out in the vestibule of what the pastors are teaching you or what the Southern Baptist Convention is teaching you, you're not on the path. But I have absolutely no problem with people's uh, testimony of, look, if the message of Jesus Christ gave you a, a, a moment uh, to anchor in your consciousness that, that things needed to change to, and you needed to become more spiritually minded, I really, really do applaud that. And I think that's great. And I think that there is a necessity for, for the Christian churches. Uh, but then again, I'd say that against any faith. Those institutions need to be there to invoke, uh, to invoke spirituality. Okay? Mm-hmm. Re- religion is something completely different. Spirituality is something completely different. And so I want to preface it that way. But, well, yeah, because it's it's also good to recognize that even people that, you know, look, there are some people that are satisfied with the explanation, and what they do with that message is take it and conduct themselves in a way that, uh, that adheres to the teachings that, uh, you know, make them, you know, here we go into dangerous territory for me, that make them quite Christ-like. You know, they, they, they do conduct their lives in a way that they might not have otherwise without those teachings, even if they are limited or a bit askew. And it is what you do with it, okay? Not only while you're being taught, but what you do with it afterwards that's important in my estimation. So, you know, here we go. And I have a great deal of respect for people that, you know, say, look, I, I've decided that I needed to live this way. And they do. They conduct themselves in a way that adheres to my belief system, which, again begins with but does not end with uh seek to do no harm and they are right in line with that and they are very good neighbors and good people and you know and all of that but sometimes they they are also waiting to be hijacked unfortunately yeah and but but, uh, let's kind of get back on this though vince had made some comments that maybe some people who are listening don't know about but he kept uh, mentioning the kzars and and all that and i think that if you are going to come at the 
come from a, a historical and literal point of view of the Bible, uh, which I'll bookmark and I'd like to get to later. But if you do believe that the Old Testament is history and the New Testament is literal history and it's all literal, uh, the topic that Vince had brought up is very important to also study and note, and it's that the people who are currently in Israel uh, are not of uh, Hebrew stock. They, they, they hail from the Khazar Mountains, which to, I think that's like near Russia. And so they're not genetically related to a historical Abraham for more than one reason, but so it's important for people to know that these are you have the uh, Ashkenazis and the Sephardic and all that, but the ones who are in Israel right now they're not Hebrew stock, so there's a, there's a problem right there. Is uh, whenever God what is God's definition? What's the New Testament's definition of who is a Jew? Of who is the seed of Abraham? Because even if you go back to Genesis and you you're underneath that whole. I will bless thee that ble- that bless you, and I will curse thee that curse you. And then you even e- expand it to say, that, well, that, that was spoken not just to Abraham, which it was, but to Abraham's seed. The question for anyone in the, in the evangelical church is to say, what is the New Testament's definition of Abraham's seed? Chuck, has anybody ever laid that out for you? Well, you know, I always thought it would be obvious that Abraham's seed would be mean his children. Uh, you know, and, and I don't think I've ever gotten a, a, another explanation mm-hmm. outside well, me... of. And, and that's why I brought up that concept of, you know, here, here's the, the Levites and the, uh, you know, and well, those who come from Judah. All right. right? Well, and can, so can, I, can, I, can I take the time to, in context, read for you the word of God? Uh, and what the definition of Abraham's seed is, and then Please you tell do. me. What, and I'm going to read it in the King James because the King James is, is beautiful language. And let us all stand for the reverence of the reading, <laughs> if you wish. Okay. Uh, if you go to the book of Galatians, okay, uh, go to chapter three, and and you start in in, in verse six. I'm going to read in context, so bear with me, okay. But by the end of this, you tell me what the definition of Abraham's seed is, okay. And a few other things, too. But uh, in, in Galatians 3, verse 6, it says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law, that's the Old Testament, are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. That's the Old Testament. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. That's the Old Testament being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Yeshua Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannuleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham, by promise. Wherefore, then serveth the law. It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily, righteousness should have been by the law. That's the Old Testament. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, 
that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Here's the kicker, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's in context, Chuck. So well, now that... in, in context, mm -hmm. who is the seed of Abraham? Well, it seems to me as though the seed of Abraham is Christ, and contained within that seed is everyone who believes in Christ, because if you believe in and truly believe in Christ, it just appears to me as though you are now part of that as well. So does genetics play any part of that? Well, it said right there that it doesn't matter about the nation. It doesn't matter about uh, whose children you were. Uh, physically, it, it seems to suggest to me that, no, that's not the case. The case is if you have faith in this, you know, in, in Christ, then that is, that's it. That's, that's the whole ball of wax. So Ooh. there there it is. You are the ones who are blessed. You have the law before Christ came, mm -hmm. because you needed to learn to behave. And then once Christ came, this is the promise that is fulfilled through your faith and Christ's existence in the first place. That's what it seems to say to me, unless I'm misunderstanding it. Mm -hmm. You got it. You, you're pretty much spot on. So if the whole fear, I mean, so the, who, who is the true seed of Abraham? Who is the true nation of Israel? According to the New Testament, um, it's those who are uh, in Christ or has Christ in them. And that's, that's who Abraham's seed is in all the promises. So even, you know, if you're going to do the whole, uh, those who bless you will be blessed and those who curse you, that's talking about people who uh, have the indwelling Christ, okay? Um, and, and I don't see how New Testament believers don't see that. Well, I do. They don't read it. Or they read it in a watered-down version or whatever. There but you go. You can't, if you read Galatians in context, it outright tells you who is considered the nation of Israel, and it's not the, 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 the Khazars that are in that strip of land right now. Okay, that's, sorry. Uh, but even if you were to, to, to go there, I mean, where I take a stance is, one, is the Old Testament literal history? Um, well, I don't know what you believe, Chuck, but here's what I know as somebody who's read the New Testament, okay? Um, if you go, actually, just to stay in the book of Galatians, you go a little to chapter 4, um, verse 21 says, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was the, of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Now, what this verse, these verses actually tell us is that um, the New Testament is telling you the Old Testament is an allegory. What's an allegory, Chuck? Well, that would be a story meant to represent something else. I mean, I'm trying to bring this down as to its uh, does it simple mean, definition. Does it, mean a, does it mean history? No, it doesn't mean that it is literal in the sense that it doesn't recount events as they occurred. It's telling you a story to teach you a lesson. Now, this um, is where, this is hmm? where we, me, you and I just lost all the fundamentalist Christians. Because right. I just said 
that the New Testament states the Old Testament is allegory and is not to be taken as literal history, they equate that statement to saying that the Old Testament is a lie or not true. And they are completely wrong. The Old Testament is true, but it is also an allegory because allegories can both be true but not literal history. Right. And they that you know that their eyes will glaze over when you bring up that no the old testament is was never intended to be taken as literal history and for anyone who does just dabbles in archaeology or history that you this is this is obvious it's evident okay so if the old testament isn't literal history is there really a genetic seed of this abraham character well, there may have been, depending on if the Abraham character is based on a real person. But if the New Testament, which we just read, says that the Old Testament is an allegory, which is a story, that means it's, there was no actual Abraham. So can a fictional character have a genetic offspring? Well, no, a fictional character cannot, but if that fictional character is meant to represent something real that's right? an alleg- now you're in allegory land right so, so you know peter parker and clark kent are going to have a genetic line in a hundred years no but it doesn't mean that those allegories don't have truth in them there's a lot of truth in uh goldilocks and the, and the three bears but it's not history well right. so, <laughs> so, you know, so it's not too far-fetched to 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 go there, I don't think, because there is nothing in the historical record that really supports th- that the Old Testament is literal history. Yeah, you'll find some chariot wheels at the bottom of the Reed Sea or the Red Sea, but I could do that in, in at the Savannah River. You know what I mean? Uh, so I, I don't believe that the Old Testament is literal history, and one of the reasons I don't believe it's literal history is because the New Testament says it's just an allegory, and, and that's okay. So how are we getting to this entire movement of supporting the nation of Israel over there if it really is, is coming from fiction anyway? You know, it doesn't make any sense. But like uh, Vince was talking about, go back to the Balfour Agreement. Around the time that C.I. Schofield put his reference Bible together that was heavily pro-Israel, okay, in 1883, Go back to the Balfour Agreement and read who the, Balf- the letter of Balfour was sent to. Dear Lord Rothschild. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so is this Zionist support, is it really biblical? Is it really Christ-like? Or is this uh, a, a very well-scripted, well-put-together, self-fulfilling prophecy that's been in the making for a very, very long time? And I'm and I, I go longer, way further than the Roth, the establishment of the Rothschild uh, dominance of our, of our banking uh, industry. It goes back farther than that, you know. So the 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 issues or the disconnect that I have is that I, if there's an, if the Old Testament isn't isn't literal history, there is no genetic offspring of David in the line of the kings, and and therefore the entire idea of this second coming of Christ in a literal way on the back of a horse is something that is actually going to happen, you know? Maybe some other group of people have an agenda and are using the ignorance of a lot of well-intentioned Christians to bring their thing about, you know? Is that possible? Because, look... You well, know, and, we t- and there you go, without even going into the Old Testament, I believe that even the book of Revelations, which is heavily laden with allegorical statements, okay, it is not literal prophecy in my mind. It, it, is, it is just, I mean, heavily. It, it is, you know, and even those who, who believe will tell you, well, this is what represents this, this represents that. I mean, they tell you that this is a, uh, you know, a, a, a seriously coded document. Um, let, let's, let's hit that for a second because, you know, if we put aside the whole argument between, uh, you know, how it is that Israel comes about and it's an allegory and, 
you know, you're basing real things on an allegory because you've been directed to do so. Mm-hmm. I mean, don't you also find it interesting that uh, the introduction of the Antichrist and, uh, and, and all of these things are also, uh, again, allegorical statements which have been seized upon by individuals who have an agenda... Uh, and I'm not even stating that I don't fully understand their real-world agenda here, uh, because that, that's the problem I have, is you want so badly to see destruction that you excuse these things. I mean, not you, Daniel, obviously, but I mean, you know, I'll justify the murder of children because they're all demon-possessed, mm-hmm. or they don't have souls, or, you know, they were uh, a part of this other family line based on that allegory where they were cast out into the wilderness and so on and so forth, and they, they come up with a whole thing. Because remember, Agar w- winds up giving birth to, uh, uh, oh, his name is eluding me right now, but uh, uh, the one son, and they wind up in the wilderness, and uh, the Lord says unto them that I'll make a nation of you as well, right, in the Scripture. And this is uh, foundationally where Islam comes from. And yeah, this you're, is talking, part of you're the, talking about Abraham and, and, and yeah, his child through the, uh, through the bond woman and the child through Sarah. Uh, yeah, Sarah. Is that, uh, that's where you get the Islamic nations, is, is from Abraham's, like, uh, bastard son. Yeah, it, but, but then again, we, we get back to is literal history. You know, did Abraham actually exist? Did David actually exist? Did Solomon actually exist? You know? Well, see, and again, um, when you listen to Hagee, what does he say? 3,000 years ago, David prayed. Yeah, sure. Whatever. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying. I mean, I look, I'm you. just, you know. I got you. But look, dude, I mean, I was a, a very astute apologist, and I really wanted to have the nuts and bolts. And an apologist in, in the Christian faith is somebody who defends Christianity. So I had to really go out there and know the arguments against Christianity in order to defend Christianity. And a lot of it has to do with the historicity of the book of Exodus. Exodus is a really critical uh, thing because it makes some very huge claims, and there should be physical evidence and tons of physical physical evidence that this these events in the book of Exodus actually happened. And so I had to go and look for them, um, and they're just not there, Chuck. And it's don't tell me that it's because well the Smithsonian's hiding certain things. Yeah, sure they are, but I like for example the whole claim that uh, the Jews, these quote-unquote Jews, were in bondage to Egypt for hundreds of years before this mass exodus took place. And then you go and you look and you go, who documented every single thing that could be documented? It was the Egyptians, bro. They gave us hieroglyphics that detailed their everyday life down to the nitty-gritty. And I think there's like one hieroglyphic in like Luxor or something, don't quote me, that has the word Jew, but in Egyptian, Jew means unskilled worker. Right. And there's no... Uh, dude, if all those plagues happened, the Egyptians would have left us a record in stone. And it's not there. And when you do get to the, to the Red Sea... You do expect to see legions of uh, chariots at the bottom of the Red Sea, and then, but they're not there. You know, I mean, you could pull up documentaries where they go diving down there, and it's just not there. Yeah, there's a chariot wheel or two, but you would expect that. That's not the, the account that Exodus gives us. And really, 40 years in the Sinai Peninsula, really? I mean, I could walk across that like in three days, I think it is, isn't it? Or six months, maybe, I don't know, something like that. But, but you mean to tell me that those millions and millions of people that left Egypt couldn't, like they couldn't find their way across the Sinai Peninsula? If you even stretched them out shoulder to shoulder, they would have like traversed the Sinai Peninsula. You know what I'm saying? We ha- you, you, look, you, you, faith is a great thing. Uh, it, it, but then again, it, it you don't want to stay there. The Bible doesn't even say stay in faith. It move on to knowing things. And the, uh, the claims of, of now look, like I said, I believe Exodus is true, but it ain't history. And I think that the guys who penned it would be just absolutely awestruck that it is taken as literal history today because it's just not, it's not there, <laughs> you know. And don't give me this hide-and-seek God. 
who loves us so much and the threat of hell is so real, he'll, you know, conveniently play hide and go seek with evidence to get you saved. No, that's not a loving and caring God at all. Uh, uh, it would be abundantly clear by a loving and caring God that there is no other solution except for this, this literal history, if, it, if that were the case. You know? Well, let me ask you about that real quick, because historically, here's what I understand. Um, you know, one could say that uh, there have been manipulations of these things because the priest class um, created the word that would be disseminated later. And at one time, there was, you know, a, a, a preacher, okay, and, and someone who would uh, explain the word as it was, you know, allegedly read from, you know, the, the very limited distribution long before uh, uh, the, uh, what is it, the Gutenberg uh, Bibles were created, right? Um, so it was disseminated verbally at one point. And in fact, I think they needed stories, allegories, to begin to teach lessons because uh, you had to entertain people to get their attention a bit. I mean, I, I think that that's very possible, and I think that that might have been the reasoning behind the methodology. But your point about it being direct and, you know, pretty simple, like, look, here, here's your choices, and if you wish to engage in that which is righteous, you, you'd figure that that would be made very easy, easily understood. Um, again, if you have a loving God. Um, which, you know, find me a Christian who doesn't say that, you know, God is a loving God, regardless of how he doesn't seem to love those that are demon-possessed uh, and, and such. But anyway, yeah. um, let us put this all in context, though, because we've gone two and a half hours now. And I want to put this in context with today's events and why it is that I keep saying that uh, this smacks of a form of paganism, the fact that there is are, are these very interesting pronunci you know pronouncements that have come from preachers who have uh, stated that there is you know they, they have interpreted for the rest of the world that God agrees with the actions of politicians, the building of buildings uh, and the establishment on particular plots of land of certain uh, facilities. And all of that going on while people are being slaughtered, literally for trying to speak out and protest, and they have been killed. Uh, again, I, I don't have the most current death count, but I'm sure it has climbed in the past uh, couple hours as we've been speaking. Yeah. And uh, again, when you, you've got probably approaching 2,000 people injured uh, in one way or another during this melee of sorts, uh, you, you have the tensions in the Middle East, and this is supposed to be the only shining star over there. Apparently, I don't, I don't see how it would shine so much. It's constantly being drenched in blood. But, um, you know, th this to me is very significant, that this all occurs. And also the fact that they chose the anniversary date, as they did. There's an esoteric purpose behind that. It's, and, it's a ritual, uh, Chuck. It's a ritual. Mm -hmm. It's a ritual. It's all a ritual, but, you know, look, I mean, like we read in, in Galatians, it says that the true Jerusalem is above. A, a true Jerusalem is not on this planet. So you have all these Baptists like Hagee, or I don't know, he's not a Baptist, but you have people like Hagee talk about, we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and then they point to some geological location on earth. I just read from the New Testament that true Jerusalem is above. It's not on this planet, man. And not to mention, you know, if, let, me, let me break down, look, Israel, okay, the nation of Israel, just simple word etymology shows you this is Egyptian in nature, this is occult stuff, and occult doesn't mean evil, you know that, it means hidden, things that are encoded to keep out the unworthy, and Israel, the word Israel is one of them, and I don't have to explain to you and probably most of your listeners, it's Isis, uh, Amen-Ra, and Elohim. It's, it's given a, an homage to the deities of Egypt and, and before that, you know, the people of the sun and, and things like that. But me, you and I had, had a long discussion about this, and I think it is relevant for people 
to look up. But if you actually go back and, and say, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, in the history of a uh, non-Christian interpretation, you say, oh, when did monotheism start? Mm. Where, did, where did that whole idea of this one deity come from? Because no other culture, you know, cultures all over the world are polytheistic uh, for the most part, or mo- as I like to call myself, a polytheistic monotheist, right? Well, right, uh, and on every continent, no matter how far you go back, you have various deities, some of them very local, you know, there's they're simply a uh, god of the swamp that we happen to live near, uh, ranging all the way from, uh, you know, very sophisticated organizations from Olympus to Valhalla, uh, on into the, uh, you know, even the, the concept of the, the gods beneath the earth, uh, you know, getting getting into all of those wonderful people, Kronos and everything else. Uh, uh, again, Greeks, Romans... Uh, Africans of all sorts, uh, various deities and well, they, other they, ethereal creatures, including elementals, and th- that's Aboriginal people on the North American continent, on the Australian continent. Um, oh, wait a minute, that's right, the Druids and things like that over in Europe. I'm smiling as I say that, but, um, you know, he- here we go. It seems as though everybody had this concept before of, of uh, multiple... multiple yeah deities Mm -hmm. yeah the people of the sun you know and and what most cultures also share is that when the people of the sun the god the sun gods were around it was a pretty atlantean type civilization things were good things were technological and there was some great cataclysm at some point Mm -hmm. and things were kind of separated and then this one asshole shows up in all cultures there's this one entity that is masculine and singular that is like, I am God, right? I'm the only God, and I'm going to, if you believe or have altars or idols or other ways, me and you have a problem, and often uh, perpetuated its worship through the sword, okay? Now, I make no bones about this. I don't have a problem with fundamentalist Christians or what they believe in, things like that. I have a problem when they fund genocide, which is what a lot of them are doing, but they're doing it through ignorance, and so I wink at that. But I have a problem with when someone uses the word Jehovah or the name Jehovah, that's when I get the willies because I have a real big problem with that name. I have a, a huge problem with this entity, uh, specifically Jehovah, Jahaveh. Okay, and I know a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses, if they're listening, they're not listening to you. Who are we fooling? Yeah, uh, I, I don't think I have a great many Jehovah's yeah. Witness listeners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, uh, Christians of a uh, of a evangelical persuasion probably didn't like that either. Either, and, and I'm so so sorry. But if you do, if you really look at Jahaveh or Jehovah, this is a war god. This is not. This is not the father of Yeshua, and. You know, I don't have we don't we don't have enough hours on your show to break it down. But I got a real big problem with people who are marching for you know with the with the banner of Jehovah, okay. And I think that I'm not alone because I think that the that the person of Jesus Christ would agree with me greatly, and outright told the Sanhedrin back in the day that they were worshiping their father, the devil. That's why they killed him. Mm. They killed him because he was making the point that this cat (laughs) that was a bloodthirsty lunatic that told, quote, the nation of Israel, historically air quotes there, to go in, take land that wasn't theirs. That's theft. So we're going to go ahead and break these Ten Commandments and kill everybody, man. Kill them all, dude. Kill the children. Kill the women. Kill their animals. Kill them all. Which that is, really is a great kin to the uh, concept of the worship of Mars. Yeah, it's yeah, Jahave. It's the war god. It's this one cat. And if you do want to well, get Ma- into Mars, is the god of war in some uh, orders? Just so you know. Didn't I say that? What did I say? You said Jahave again. Jahave and Mars is the same guy, in my opinion. Uh, there, there you so, go. That's what I was waiting for you to say. Yeah, you didn't correct me, dude. No, <laughs> but. But yeah, I mean, you've got this one entity. I mean, and me and you have gone back before. Look, I, the the person of Yeshua, um, I don't believe that he was a monotheist. 
Okay, I think that's kind of obvious. I think that the entire idea of him being at Caesarea Philippi at, at, the, at Pan's Gate there uh, was him tipping a hat. I, I mean, and I also see that whenever Paul comes along, when the Apostle Paul comes along and he starts preaching unto to the Romans Jesus, he's standing in a pantheon of the old Roman the gods, and they have a statue that says to the unknown God. And Paul doesn't waste one single second telling these people, oh, by the way, your pantheon of God is all, you know, the, all those are devils and demons. He doesn't say that at all. He says, I come to preach unto you the unknown God. And then he preached unto him Jesus. Paul didn't try to, to, to uh, break down polytheism. Okay, so there's an issue here with polytheism versus monotheism. And mm -hmm. in the historical record, when you say where did monotheism come from, of course it goes back to Egypt, and we end up in 1440 B.C., in Egypt with Pharaoh Akhenaten. This well, is wait the a guy. minute now, because a lot of people would say that uh, when, when Moses was being spoken to, mm -hmm. he was told mm -hmm. that there was only one God. Well, okay. Moses, huh? So Moses was, uh, he, whenever he was uh, a child, when he was born, he, he, his life was in danger and he had to be hidden away, correct? Right. Oh, okay. And then uh, when, whenever uh, he was, of course, he was, he was raised in the Pharaoh's court. Is that correct? Well, after he was placed in a basket on the river and then he was retrieved, uh, according yeah, to sure. the story, if I remember correctly, yeah. Yeah, he was an Egyptian, so he was being raised by the pharaohs there. He was, you know, all that. And um, mm -hmm. he had a staff, yeah, right? Kind of like the, the royal serpent of the pharaoh. He had a staff, yeah, a magical right. staff, yeah. Okay, and, and then he uh, was spoken to after killing an Egyptian and, and having to flee. He was spoken to out of a burning bush. Uh, and it was this, this god that not even the Hebrews allegedly in Egypt they don't even know who this cat is. This is entity that just shows up and says, "I am the God of your forefathers." All of a sudden, right? You know, well, everybody... yeah, because pre previous to that, they didn't have this God. No, of course he, not. Yeah, he just kind of yeah. appeared. So okay. this this entity who's saying he's ma it's masculine and it speaks to this Moses person uh, and says, "There's only one God." And it's so, this entity is absolutely convinced that there's only one God and is not jealous in any way, so much to the point that this entity feels the need to send his harbinger into Egypt to battle all of the other gods that don't exist with these plagues. This is a really rational and logical entity that's singular and masculine and demands soul worship. So let's just keep that in mind. And it's, it's even cool enough to have the death angel go over and, and require a blood sacrifice on the, the mantle of the doors and kills a bunch of innocent firstborns, not just Egyptians. It doesn't say that. It says anyone who wasn't behind the blood of the lamb, their firstborn was killed. So this God has really got a part on for going in and killing innocent kids uh, because of whatever. You know, they didn't feel like killing a lamb and eating and putting blood everywhere. And then this entity gets uh, this Moses person to lead all of these others who previously were pagans, quote-unquote, away from Egypt. So, okay, that's all cool, and we've already discussed the book of Exodus. Where's the physical evidence of these things? Where's the Ark of the Covenant? <laughs> where, where is this, uh, this mountaintop where the tablets were written by the hand of God that should have some type of of uh, residual readings of, I don't know, radiation or ionized gas. I don't know. There should be a lot there. Don't point to these mountain ranges that are a little charred uh, uh, over there in the peninsula and say, well, that's it. That's, that's, that's where you got the tablets. Don't show me the Red Sea and say there should be, if Exodus is literal history, there should be... Uh, a, a massive museum underneath the Red Sea, and then when you can't show me that, you say, well, maybe it was the Reed Sea. Or try to explain it away. Don't give me all that, okay? Well, because legions were swallowed, right? Yeah. I mean... Sure, man. Yeah, it was, a ton it was tons and tons and tons, okay? okay? But when you actually go back into the historical record around that time, and you say, who, who in the historical record was this guy that was spoken to or believed in monotheism or started the whole monotheistic thing? You do, you get to Pharaoh Akhenaten. 
1440 BC in like the 18th dynasty. And the historical record shows that this pharaoh was basically the bastard son of Imhotep III, or Imhotep III, excuse, I don't know, you know, the, exactly, I'm not an Egyptologist, I'm just a dude who can look stuff up on Google, I guess. Right. But you have uh, this pharaoh, and there was some questionable stuff about the lineage and who was going to be the successor to the throne, and Hotep III had a, a first child that was murdered uh, at birth, and so when, when Hotep IV came along, or Pharaoh Akhenaten, um, the queen sent him away from Thebes because his life was in danger. Mm. So he, he grew up away from Thebes, away from the, the throne, and was really, really butthurt at the priests of Amun-Ra. Now, the Egyptians believed that Amun-Ra was the god of Egypt, but there was a lot of other gods like Isis and Horus and Anubis and Thoth and all of that. So they, they believed in a hierarchy of these deities, of the people of the sun. And so this kid, who his, you know, he's got a silver spoon born in his mouth, but he's a little butthurt because these priests of, uh, of Amun-Ra don't think he's worthy. And so he's got his whole childhood to harbor this grudge against the, 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 their rituals and their beliefs. And then when his father gets sick, he's brought back to Egypt after, you know, having to be in exile, right? He's brought back. There's some questions about whether or not he can become pharaoh, so he has to marry his sister and all this other good stuff. And the, the priests of Amun-Ra are like, we still have some questions about whether or not you should be the legitimate pharaoh because Amun-Ra might not actually possess your body. And Pharaoh Akhenaten says, you know what? Screw Amun-Ra. Screw your pantheon of gods that have blessed Egypt, that have made Egypt be prosperous and, and all of this, because Amun-Ra is just, he, that's old stuff. We now worship Aton, this singular masculine entity. And let's shut down all of the mystery schools. Let's shut down the initiation of the pyramid. Let's get rid of all of these old pantheons because now all of us are going to worship this masculine singular entity, Aton, which is where you get the, the term the uh, Pharaoh Akhenaten, the son of Aton, this masculine singular entity. And that's where you get monotheism from. That's exactly where you get monotheism from in the historical record. And you line his story up, and beat for beat, it matches the parable that you see in Moses. Mm. So, Also interesting side note, which really doesn't seem connected, but in a way, in my mind, can be connected in a synchronistic fashion. Uh, Aton LaVey, mm -hmm. being the guy who uh, gives birth to modern Satanism, um, which effectively teaches the individual that they are God themselves, uh, effectively, you know, but but not in the uh, connected to the universe sort of way. <laughs> okay, I, I find it interesting that uh, that's the guy who codifies what we call Satanism today. But anyway, please continue. No, I mean, so it, so it 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 starts to put a picture together. Okay, of where monotheism comes from, and of course, if you, if you look at uh, uh, what happened with Pharaoh Akhenaten? I mean, it his his idea of monotheism and his uh, royal decree, so to speak, brought Egypt to its knees, to the point to where the priests of the Temple of of Amun Ra, uh, which is also funny because Christians always end their prayers with Amen, and they have most of them have no clue it comes from the Egyptian god of the sun, Amun Ra. That's where it is. It doesn't mean. You know, as he said it, I agree with that, brother. No, it doesn't. It comes from Amun-Ra. Well, uh, during that, that dynasty, I think he ruled for 17 years. And it got so bad that the, uh, the, temp the, the priest of the temple of Amun-Ra said, we got to do something about this guy. For the first time in Egyptian history, a, a pharaoh had screwed up so bad that the priest of Amun-Ra and the Egyptian people said, we have got to get this guy out of here. Because to defy the Pharaoh was to defy the, the Amun-Ra. And so it had to be really, really bad for the, for the Egyptians to say, you got to go, dude. And what do you see whenever they say that? They say, you see an exodus. You see Pharaoh Akhenaten and his kids leaving on an exodus, Egypt. And then Egypt is, is brought back to you know, the temple of Amun-Ra and, and the worship of Amun-Ra. And, you know, you look at things like, well, where did, they, where did this family bloodline go 
uh, that was really butthurt at polytheism, really butthurt uh, with the gods of uh, the sun. You know, where did this family go, and do they have a chip on their shoulder? And are, have they been doing some things throughout history? And that's where, you know, when you actually follow those, you get into the bloodlines of the Illuminati, which sounds like conspiracy to some, but it's history. You know, like, like with this whole thing going on in Israel today, you know, with the, the uh, Balfour Agreement being to the Rothschilds, trace that family lineage all the way back, and it does go to Egypt. And so you really, it's not so much that you have a war between Christianity, Judaism, and Islam going on. What you actually see in the historical record is that once monotheism popped up, first order of business when its followers got into any land was burn all of their written material and kill them en masse. Kill the Cathars, kill the Druids, you kill any of them and take their holy uh, relics and their books and burn them. Burn them. Get rid of the knowledge that they all share. Because these cats are following a, a, a singular entity that is a jealous God. Very, very jealous. But he's convincing you it, he's the only God. But he's a jealous one. Jealous of who, man? If you're it, who are you jealous of? Well, that's an interesting thing because I always wondered about two. Well, there's two things here. There, there, there's something that I want to enter into the conversation, but there's also a question on Skype that I'd like to enter into here because we're almost at the end of hour three, uh, and I, I think I'll leave it at that. Quite honestly, uh, for tonight, maybe we'll have to do a part two to this. But um, two things: one, um, when we take a look at uh, you know, h how this came to be and the behaviors of, you know, d d destroy what was there before. I mean, this is what conquerors do as well, right? I mean, Napoleon, even when he went uh, to different places, sought to uh, deface and destroy uh, different deities and all that. And he's been described as an antichrist-like figure. But this is what conquerors do based on the template. Um, and, and jealousy is interesting because if you are the only God and there is no other God, why do you need a commandment that says, worship no gods other than me? Yeah. Uh, which I find interesting in the Ten Commandments. Um, now, I'll just leave that out there and you can address it if you like, but the other question that came in through the Skype is uh, the phrase hallelujah, which uh, Hagee ended his speech with, and uh, or prayer or whatever it is you want to call it, yeah. Uh, his benediction, according to uh, according to him, um, you know, what about that in the uh, in in context with what it is you're talking about? And also, you know, my my commentary there: if you are the only God, then why do you need to specifically tell your followers not to worship any other god? Yeah. Well, I mean, look, dude. Um, it all goes back to Genesis, really, um, because I mean. Hallelujah, from old Baptist memory, means praise the Lord, and it basically is the same thing in every language. But I have a problem with the word Lord. <laughs> you know, um, when you go to the book of Genesis, man, I mean, it. keep in mind the Bible, when it was penned, didn't have chapters and verses. You know, that's for us. And it also was way more than 66 books. I mean, the 66 books, that's, that's, that's a cool, thanks, uh, Constantine. We appreciate that. But mm. when you go back to Genesis, if that's where you really want to start, even though Job is actually the oldest, then what it says right in chapter 1 is that in the beginning Elohim created the heavens and, and, and the earth, which is plural. So it doesn't say God. It says gods, and it's also masculine and feminine. So it's the gods and the goddesses. That's right in Genesis chapter 1. It doesn't right. say God, okay? That's our English translation. It's the gods and the goddesses, the council of the gods, the Elohim, okay? You get to chapter 2 when the trouble starts is when this cat called Lord God shows up, which is Adonai, Aton, nay, right? Okay. <laughs> Akhenaten's Aton, Adonai, Lord God. This cat, it doesn't seem to be very omniscient, also seems to have a physical form because he's walking in the cool of the garden, right? He's, he's, he's isolated to one place, which is in, in a physical body, it seems, and doesn't know a lot of what's going on, has to ask questions, right? When this guy shows up, 
is when all the trouble starts. And it's a singular masculine. And even, I mean, you can go ask any rabbi, what, what is that in Genesis chapter 1? Elohim, me Elohim, the gods and the goddesses. So Christians right off the bat in Genesis are confused. Now, whenever you get to Yeshua or Jesus, he says that the devil, this devil person, was a liar and a murderer from the beginning and, and places the devil character in the garden. Okay? Mm. In the garden. Well, if this devil character in the New Testament was in the garden and was a liar, then if you're going to go back to Genesis and look at it, you you got a few characters in the garden. You have this God character, you have a serpent, you have Adam, and you have Eve. And this God character says that if you eat of the tree of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, in that day ye shall surely die. And then you have this serpent character, and fundamentalists will say that the serpent is the devil, right? No. Now, let's put that on a back burner somewhere, because I know where, where the fundamentalists will go. They'll say, oh, he's saying Lucifer is God and all this other stuff. But my question is, who told an untruth? Because we know that Adam and Eve ate from this tree, and we do know that their eyes were indeed opened. All right? Because the serpent said, when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and ye shall be as gods, and ye shall not surely die. Okay, and so when this singular masculine entity shows up and says, what has happened here, you know, you know, we ate of the tree and our eyes are open and all that good stuff, did they die? Well, I've heard the explanation because I've asked that question myself. And I've yeah. heard the explanation that they, they would they not died. have. But Go, They died spiritually? Don't say that. Oh, no, 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 no. That That isn't what I was told. What I was told is that uh, they would have had no need to die had they not done that. In other words, the fact that the you know Adam and Eve characters and their offspring end up dying like we all do is because of that. Yeah, well, that's silly. If we're going to well, take, if, I thought if, so too, but I'm just telling you what the explanation I was yeah, given. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the explanation that I was given was that they died spiritually. Is what it means, brother. No, that's not what it says, man. Don't sit here and tell me to take stuff literally over here when it comes to the nation of Israel. And then whenever we get to the book of Genesis and it says, in the day that ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. Okay? Well, and, oh, that's, that's, that's the not problem. literal. That's not literal. No, they didn't die. Who told the untruth? Well, I guess that's why you have so many different razor uh, cuts in the pie of knowledge here because... I guess, you know, you, you, you decide one piece here is uh, literal, the next piece may or may not be literal, and your experience varies because of what you decided is an allegory and what is not. Yeah. I mean, so it, it, it has to do with, I mean, honestly, a lot of people really are putting a lot of faith and trust in, in being taught what the scriptures mean. Uh-huh. And I, I don't... I mean, I, that it, when, when the student is ready, a master will appear. But the scriptures also says that until the time when you ought to be teachers, you are in need of a teacher, you're supposed to eventually evolve spiritually to where you don't need a teacher, that you are a master yourself. You're not supposed to call anybody father. You're not supposed to call anybody rabbi. You're supposed to actually be the head of your own church, which is yourself. Mm. And, and and that's your goal, man. That's what the scriptures is trying to lead you to. Um, but you have uh, most of the evangelical church, they're not there. And they're being taught by pastors who were taught in seminaries that were uh, handed the C.I. Schofield reference Bible. And that's where you get this whole pre uh, or a pre-millennial, pre-tribulation, dispensational end of the world. Jesus is literally coming back and, and all this good stuff. And it, like we said earlier, go back to who, when when this was all really started back in the 1800s uh, with C.I. Schofield and Herzl and the Rothschild family and Zionism stemming uh, from that whole thing. This has nothing to do with biblical prophecy at all. The book of Revelation is a psychology book. It's a book about the, yeah, it is future prophecy, but it's supposed to be applied in an internal individual level, not mm. as a historical blueprint to blow up the world, which well, is see, what it's been used for. 
Yeah, and that's the interesting thing here, because the overall theme that I'm getting from everything that I've asked you about and you've described here is the idea that this is a part of the maturation process. In other words, eventually, you know, like just like in everyday life, leaving religion away from it, uh, we are all born as children. We may have no knowledge, not even of the ability to walk, right? Because that's, that's the way human beings are designed. A lot of other animals can immediately walk, feed, do a lot of things all on their own. We don't get that. We get to grow and to learn and to develop and take in new bits of knowledge as we go further, right? And it seems to me like they're telling you that this is grade school. And if you want a full education, you're going to have to graduate and go beyond it. Uh, it's not as though these lessons are not valuable, but they are not everything, it seems like to me. And the allegory, uh, or allegories, I should say, that are contained in a lot of these things are meant to be read several different ways because it seems as though there are multi-layered messages and understandings that can be gathered here. But then again, Daniel, what do yeah. I know? I'm just a pagan. Well, so <laughs> well, I mean, look, you also I, get into. I want to. I want to sort of wrap this up, if you don't mind. I mean, do, do you, I, I think we have really given a heavy treatment to this, yeah. and put into context what's occurred today and what's going to continue to occur here. Because here's the thing about it: uh, this is the beginning of a serious problem in, in my mind. And it's not about death, because death is not uh, the point of fear or the point of worry or concern, even in my mind. You know, we, we, we will all go there, you know, eventually. And it is what it is. It's not something to be afraid of. That, that would be like being afraid of me taking my next breath. It's, it's the natural thing that's going to occur. But we don't all have to encourage... Uh, massive executions and the treatment of other, in other words this is not this is not the way to do it this is not to follow somebody else's script which has been you know the warped version of, uh, of, of what people have been taught and why have they been taught it well there's a lot of uh, different understandings that can go into the why here but altogether I think it's about uh, seizing upon people's fear to, uh, to create a circumstance by which many will profit in their own way and uh, will get what it is they wish. Now, I, I don't necessarily understand the whole of the motive, but I can see the operation and the fact that, uh, again, fear and trauma and basis of core beliefs being used against entire groups of people is uh, is in play and gee that sounds awfully familiar doesn't it yeah i mean here's i mean to try to wrap it all up look it's like this man the uh, support of israel look and and am i going to sit here and pretend that i have a solution to things that are going on there no, i don't i'm not no <laughs> you know i i don't believe that you need to be uh, committing genocide against the Palestinian people who, if there was a historical Jesus, would actually be the genetic offspring of that guy. But I'm not saying uh, that that's a, a good thing. In fact, I think it's a horrible thing. But I'm not saying push Israel into the map either because it's there. I deal with like right now. So I can't change what happened whenever Israel became a nation. It's there now. you got people living there now. Um, I think that a solution is ultimately going to come um, I don't think that it is going to come correctly at the, the point of a sword or with bullets and what's weird about it is that like like Hagee and his stupid little prayer was like let's tell the people of Iran and Islamic terrorists I mean gotta throw that word Islamic in front of terrorists don't you because you want, you want Islam and terrorists to be synonymous which some of the best people on the face of this planet that I've ever met are Islam, uh, and the you know the, it, it pick up the Quran, Christians, and read it in the first couple of surahs when it says that, that the Christians and Jews are people of the book and are not enemies of Islam. You look, you know, God, I don't want to get off on that tangent, but uh, you know the whole support of the nation of Israel and all this warfare type is very carnal. 
And you and I and people like us, you and I discussed this over the weekend, is that there is a spiritual as a huge spiritual aspect to this. It is a struggle between entities, and we should play a part in it. We really should play a part in it. And those who are really in tune with the spirit, you know, they're very earth-based. They understand that the earth is a living entity. It is. If you're not doing any spiritual work that is connected to earth, you're wasting your time. And that people like you and I, Chuck, with our diverse practices of do no harm first, uh, we are, like, like we said, we are the uh, antivirus to this infection that's hit our, our collective consciousness of this monotheistic uh, thing, this cancer that's invaded our world. And it's going to take a spiritual solution. Now, you could look at the Christians and tell them to pick up Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. And it's for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Well, you know, if you want to really be in the spiritual warfare, you have to cast off imaginations or figments of people's imaginations like their spin on, quote, literal history that gives them their agenda. And you have to do what Jesus said, or Yeshua. You have to go within yourself because that is where the kingdom of heaven is. Look, Yeshua and the New Testament says that we are one with Christ and Christ is one with the Father. If there is, if you want to know, the, the New Testament says that there are many antichrists. The, what an antichrist is, is anything that stands in the place of the true Christ. So if you ever bend your knee to another man or woman or entity or idol, whatever it is, that is antichrist. So if some cat magically through Project Blue Beam or whatever, pops up on a horse and sits on some throne in some brand new temple and says he is Christ, I know, having read my New Testament, that that dude is the Antichrist. But you're going to have a ton of, quote, Bible-believing Christians who will look at this individual and say and swear that it's Jesus and swear that it's the Messiah. When Christ said, if they say I'm in the secret places, don't go there. If they say I'm over here, don't believe them. Because Christ is you, and it's me. We're all Christ. Within, within we are Christ. There is no physical second coming of any Christ. That's the Antichrist. Anything outside of the temple of you is Antichrist. And you know, until people start to really understand what Yeshua was talking about, you're always going to have this desire to put divinity outside of yourself. And that's where you get tyrants, and that's where you get these war messiahs. And it's, it, you know, we as a col the spiritual people who know this, that we're all interconnected, and that we all are God. There is no spot where God is not. We're all characters in the imagination of the dream of God. Until we all really get that, then this stuff is going to keep going on over there. You know what I'm saying? Uh, well, absolutely. And, and just like watching people place their faith and believing that, no, this man that has come to us through the selection process is now the man who is going to enact the great changes that are going to bring all of these... Listen, putting your faith in... One instrument of God, a man whose hand you're never going to shake, whose ideas you have no idea what they actually are, but they've been given to you in a story form through your internet, through your television, whatever, to place your belief that this is the earth-changing, the world-changing figure. Um, here we go again. It, it, it's the problem. It's, it, you know, so... What I would actually like to, you know, I invite people who are spiritual of all different proclivities, who, and you guys know who you are. Look, we meet, you and I both know that there is a ritual being done, that, that the, the shedding of blood is, in fact, appeasing some entity that really seems to like death and destruction. That's happening, man. It's happening right now. 
at an energetic point on this planet that is somebody's feeding off of something. I'll tell you that. And so we as spiritual people like you and I, Chuck, need to go. And I would urge people to do it now. Go into your secret place, whatever you call it, and do your secret thing and and try to help counterbalance what's being done over there. And you and I, we don't have time to do it now, but, you know, it did occur to me, me and you were trying to break down the occultic and esoteric meaning of the Avengers Infinity War, and it finally hit me. I said, it's the Old Testament. It is the Old Testament, right? And I think that we are having, we're giving the opportunity to assist now in uh, getting rid of this entity, this singular, masculine, bloodthirsty lunatic uh, we're being given the opportunity to spiritually partake in weaning it off of our existence and this planet, and I think we all need to do it now. You know, I think we no. really, we really do need to tap into the spiritual and do some praying in our own way for for true peace of true Jerusalem, which is a is above, not on this planet. It's above. No, absolutely true. And here's the thing: uh, what was the first thing I said? Because you and I actually went to go see that movie together. And uh, what was the first thing I said to you about it is that uh, that is not the whole of the story. Now, I had no idea that they planned to film another movie that connects to it or anything else. But uh, but I knew, based on what I had seen, that yeah. this is half the story. The, the, short, the short explanation is go see it and understand that that first one, Infinity Wars, is the Old Testament. And then it will all make sense esoterically to you if you understand it's the Old Testament. That's it. I mean, it is it is a bit striking the way it ends. Not going to give it to you here, but it is a bit interesting the way it ends because I've never seen a movie of its type end like that. But anyway, uh, then again, what you know? How does the Old Testament conclude? <laughs> yep. There you go. So we'll we'll leave it at that. And uh, it's been over three hours now, and I appreciate your indulgence, Daniel. Obviously. Uh, but uh, we, we've had a lot of people actually stick around through this entire discussion. Um, and, you know, we, we may revisit this at a, at a time soon if it, uh, if it is necessary, according to uh, what is presented to us, I think. Yeah, sure, if, uh, I don't get, if you and I don't get black bag tonight. <laughs> yeah, if something very strange doesn't happen to the two of us tonight, I think we'll be able to revisit this topic and, uh, and go through some more of the... Revelations contained within, <laughs> if you will, and uh, you could take that to mean a lot of things. I'm not going to break it down, but but obviously uh, I still say you know go over to Daniel's website, downloadcontent.com. It may or may not be there too much longer. We shall see. Um, now I I didn't give any specifics there, but you might want to go over there if you're interested in Daniel's work. And also, uh, then came the flood, which does have something to do with tonight's discussion, but we didn't get into the book at all, uh, not specifically. Um, anyway, there is a, there's a lot more that can be discussed, and we could go over this for many more hours, but I think we gave it a, a pretty good treatment. What do you think? I, I, you know, actually, I think it would be a cool invitation for somebody who may listen that is pro-Israel and does come from an evangelical perspective. That you, you ought to invite somebody like that on the show to, to break it down for you. I'd love to, to sit in on that. But, you know, it is a, it, it, what we talked about tonight is a hot topic, and it's a topic that could be discussed ad nauseum. It's just I think that, honestly, at the end of the day, you'd see some physical bloodshed happening over there in that place. There is an open invitation to World War III, and I just don't think that it has to happen, man. I think that we were created for something so much better, and we're right here on the cusp, and we have the knowledge you know, to, to do it collectively, to really evolve our, our place in the universe. And I just it's not going to be done through violence, man. So all you spiritual people, you really need to do your thing and, and jump in the game uh, and, and try to help alleviate some of this suffering that's going on well, over there because of the names of gods. No, you're right, and, and, and agreed on all counts. And one more thing, if you are somebody who listened to this discussion and feel as though uh, we did not represent something that, uh, you know, we missed something very serious here and you want to talk about being uh, pro-Israel, uh, I will most definitely have you on respectfully. You can contact me at info at ocelli.com 
and uh, I will respond to you as quickly as I see your message. Usually takes me about a day, maybe, to get back to you, depending on what part of the world you're in. It might be 24 hours or so. It might be two minutes. Uh, but the thing is, if you're very seriously would like to be part of a discussion about exactly this topic, or as the story continues to evolve, unfortunately, uh, before our eyes, because we do have the ability now to see across the world in an instant, um, you know, if, if that is your desire and you wish to be in opposition to what Daniel and I had to say tonight, I'm more than happy and will handle that without, uh, you know, without being uh, rude or crude or any of that kind of stuff, uh, certainly on this show, and I'll talk to you about it, and I'd like you to explain to me how wrong I am to not be in support of what I see. But, uh, but I cannot lend my support to what I'm watching uh, unfold, and, and certainly I agree with you. Uh, we can do better. That, that's, that's really the key here is we, we, we have many a choice here. And we can do a lot better than what's being done. And uh, I, I don't support genocide. I don't support the suffering of individuals, especially not uh, based on interpretations of scriptures or spiritual beliefs. Uh, I, I think, again, uh, those that are not harming anyone should be able to worship whatever they choose and, uh, or to not worship whatever they do not choose. And uh, I think that most people should be left alone <laughs> for the most part, you know. But you, you have a disagreement. You think that uh, you can tell me exactly how it is you know that people are demon-possessed and deserving of being blown to bits and children are deserving of, uh, you know, being tear-gassed and killed and all that kind of stuff. And the uh, nation-state of Israel is that important to the rest of the planet. I invite you to contact me, info at ocelli.com. So, Daniel, thanks again, and uh, I can't tell you, uh, you know, it's, it's, there, there's so much that could still be explored here. Oh, yeah. But I think we, uh, in, in three-plus hours, gave them a lot of food for thought, and, uh, and, and I think that I've been respectful about this entire discussion. I've actually held back. I'm pretty disgusted and revolted by a lot of what I see and what I see being justified. But I, I didn't do that. I, I wanted to discuss it and say, look, here's where I see a contradiction. And is this my correct understanding about this? I mean, do I see it uh, askew because I don't understand? This is what I wanted to do tonight is to lay it out and say, look, you know, there's, there's a couple of different ways to examine this situation. But, uh, but to me, there, there is a clear definition to what should not be occurring. And I certainly would not want to see uh, hundreds of thousands, millions more, a third world war, uh, people suffering and, and absolutely uh, uh, living in, in a hellish state on earth when there is no need for this to keep going on. So that is, Mo that is Mo what it's like Carlin said, mother earth is going to shake some of us off, dude. <laughs> You know, it's going to happen. I'm telling you. But you know what? I love you, Chuck. I think we kind of covered it. And uh, play your bump music and let's get the hell out of here. Absolutely. So that is the end of the show for tonight. And it's only just moon day or Monday. So we'll get into uh, some other topics, I'm sure, throughout the week. Although we may revisit this one before the week is over. But Daniel Lewis Crumpton, once again, uh, author and interesting webmaster at uh, downloadedcontent.com. My friend, it is, uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And every once in a while, we can have a private conversation in public and get something done, too. So, what do you think? Yeah, sounds like a plan. All right. So, stay tuned to the Ocelli.com stream. I'm sure there'll be something else after this. And we will replay and do all of those things throughout the next few days. Remember, guys, I am merely Ocelli. Every last one of you who participates in the show are the effect. Take care.